My name is Yona Mosehammer, and I'm an undergraduate student in Santa Barbara studying environmental science and film production. I would often look out at the oil rigs off the coast and wonder what they're still doing there. I had heard from my professors that they're no longer productive. To me, they seemed like unsightly reminders of industry's negative impact. Why hasn't anyone taken these down? After doing some research, I realized that California has a legacy of oil. The story of how oil is brought up from far down in the earth is exciting. The products of oil or petroleum are necessary for us to live the way we do today. Here's a brief recap of oil's history in Southern California. In 1792, English explorer James Cook anchored his ship in the Santa Barbara Channel. He noticed that the sea had an appearance of dissolved tar floating on its surface, which covered the ocean in all directions. In 1883, H.L. Williams found oil spurting from the ground a few feet from his Santa Barbara home, following a small earthquake. He took notice and saw an opportunity. The idea of drilling specifically for oil was new. In 1896, Williams and prospectors found wells on the beach and in the shallows off the coast. They built a makeshift wharf and commenced the world's first offshore drilling operation, the Summerland Oil Field. On May 8, 1945, with the completion of World War II, large-scale offshore drilling in the United States began in earnest. BJ Day halts the redeployment of thousands of troops from Europe to the South Pacific and the greatest American army in history begins a slow process of demobilization. By 1955, gasoline sales had doubled since 1945. A project was launched by a group of oil companies to create an offshore drilling machine that would stand amidst the deep ocean currents and drill a mile into the ocean floor. Two years later, the first rigs were built that were unattached to the shore in any way. With this capability, the market for marine drilling boomed. Then, devastation. In 1969, six miles off the coast, Union Oil's Platform A erupted in a blowout, and in a 10-day period, an estimated 100,000 barrels of crude oil spilled into the channel and onto the beaches of Southern California. The spill ravaged marine wildlife, killing an estimated 3,500 seabirds and marine mammals such as dolphins, elephant seals, and sea lions. The public outrage that resulted from the spill is directly responsible for the majority of environmental legislation today, and galvanized the birth of the environmental movement in the United States. It remains the largest oil spill that California has ever experienced. In 1970, citizens coordinated the first ever Earth Day. It is now celebrated in more than 139 countries each year. Also in response to the spill, a group of faculty founded the first environmental studies program in the United States at the University of California, Santa Barbara. It seemed that in order to keep up with industrialization, industry had put up the rigs so fast that they didn't have time to think about taking them down. But that still doesn't answer my question. Why are those rigs still up there today? Then, while attending a course offered by the Decision Education Foundation, I began to find some clues. I learned that decision scientists were involved in a project that explored the options for decommissioning the rigs. What I didn't know, and what many people don't, is that far below the surface, the steel structures that support the oil rigs have become home to a thriving ecosystem known as the artificial reefs. I wanted to know more about the Rigs to Reefs project and this thing called decision analysis. So I visited Dr. Max Henrion, the lead decision analyst on the project. So how did you get pulled into doing all of this? What, what's your story? When I was a student, I you know, was interested in how do we help make decisions in a more coherent and rational way. I started doing my PhD in that area and then discovered that actually there already was this field of decision analysis. I want you to explain this all to me in person and up close to the rigs. Would you be able to do that? That would be fun. <laughs> I think that would be great. You know, having worked on this project for you know quite a while, I have only seen the rigs from far away. I'd love to go close up to one. All right, I'm excited <laughs> to do that. My name is Captain Carson Shevitz. I'm a United States Merchant Mariner licensed by the U.S. Coast Guard, and today we're going to go out and get pretty close to the platforms off of Santa Barbara. This was my chance to ask about decision analysis. What is the profession all about? What do decision analysts do? 
So decision analysis is a whole set of techniques to help individuals or organizations make decisions in a more effective way. You know, we recognize that most, well, all humans, when we make decisions in an intuitive, unaided way, we're liable to confusion, to biases, to illusions. And so decision analysis provides some ways of looking carefully, structuring the objectives, structuring the uncertainty, structuring the decision options, and quantifying it in a way that allows us to look more rationally at the set of options. Did you catch that? Decision analysis is the process of defining all the possible options in any given decision. A decision scientist will use mathematics, probabilistic thinking, and data modeling to address uncertainties and evaluate potential outcomes. So the California Ocean Science Trust, seeing that this issue of decommissioning was such a political hot potato, decided that maybe if they commissioned a study of the science and the engineering and the economics, that would help clarify issues and perhaps cool down some of the, the, the concerns. The client, the person who is supervising a study on how decommissioning the oil rigs would impact our ocean. Her name is Skyly McAfee and she worked for the Ocean Science Trust. So the question was what to do with the platforms. If they're no longer productive, what do we do? Um, do we consider turning them into aquaculture facilities or offshore renewables? Do we decommission them to the sea floor um, as law prescribed? Or was there another solution that considered the ecosystem services that those rigs are providing as hard offshore reefs to an entire community of invertebrates and vertebrates, you know, vibrant fishes that actually, you know, seemed like it was contributing to to our resources offshore. It is an issue that divided the environmental groups, it divided commercial fisheries from recreational fisheries, and um, therefore the state said we want this independent entity, Ocean Science Trust, to just gather the information, not tell us what to do, but gather the technical information that will underpin our decisions. They asked Brock to put together a project um, a multidisciplinary team. Dr. Brock Bernstein was the project manager on Rigs to Reefs. He put together a team of highly qualified scientists and engineers. So we had a team of what I like to call rock stars or all stars. We all realized that there were lots and lots of moving parts to the, the problem and that it would be a real challenge to try to integrate and synthesize air quality and effects on marine mammals and effects on birds and effects on water quality and costs and all that. Some of them are highly quantitative, some were very subjective and qualitative. And I knew from previous work in complex problems like this that it would be really valuable to have something like a decision model, a mathematical decision model, to help integrate and synthesize all of the different factors or attributes as they're called. This term attributes is a key concept that decision analysts use. An attribute is a quality that will be affected by the decision. For example, air quality is affected by the pollution that machines create to dismantle the rigs. So air quality is an attribute that must be acknowledged in the conversation. So we learned to have the conversation both with the academic scientists to inform them how to be as relevant as possible um, in how they're synthesizing their work. We don't need a, a stack of their publications. We need their expertise to help them come to some clarity about the exact kinds of information that would keep them moving forward toward best possible decisions. So the issue of possibly turning decommissioned platforms into artificial reefs has been on the table in Southern California for a long time. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. One is you can leave them in place, just cut the top off so there's no more risk to shipping and leave them in place. Or you can cut them off at the seabed and transport them to another reefing location. And both options have been considered in the past in Southern California, and none of those ever flew. They ever got off the ground for a variety of reasons. Brock is about to mention three attributes that jumped out immediately to the team. Risk to shipping, pollution and water quality, and marine resources and fish biomass. There were concerns about um, pollution. There were concerns about risk to shipping. There was uncertainty about whether or not 
the, an artificial reef would actually benefit fish populations. And uh, especially after the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, there was a lot of suspicion and resentment towards oil companies and, and a lot of very strong sentiment that the oil companies should be required to comply with the original terms of their leases and remove everything from the ocean and return the seabed to its original condition. Makes sense, right? Once they are done pumping oil, why leave them there? So I talked to Linda Kropp, an environmental lawyer who has dealt extensively with offshore oil and gas litigation. We've been working on the issue of what to do when these oil platforms complete their life cycle. Um, and it's important to know that when they were first installed, starting back in the 60s, we were told that when they completed their production life cycle that they would be removed and the environment would be restored to its natural conditions. And so it's really important that people realize that when we're talking about these platforms it's not just steel structures, it's everything that's been dumped and discharged overboard and all the shells that have accumulated, um, the caissons, um, in the piles that have been left offshore Summerlin, they've been tested and they've tested positive for arsenic and heavy metals and PCBs and zinc and, and that's what's in the environment now. Um, so the groups that we represent uh, want to make sure that these sites are completely cleaned up because when you look at the long term um, and what's healthy for the ocean environment, that's what is the most healthy. In other words, she wanted the rigs completely removed. This is an attribute that the team defined as strict compliance with the original leases. You know, in California, it's very different than the Gulf of Mexico, where they have an active rigs to reef program. The Gulf of Mexico doesn't have any natural rocky habitat offshore, whereas we do. And so we don't need to create something because we already have rocky habitat. I was the lead prosecutor for the government entities that prosecuted Union Oil, Mobile Oil, Gulf Oil, and Texaco. So the tension is, leave the oil out there if we ever need it, well we can develop it then. Uh, the environmentalists don't want any more oil drilling and the people of Santa Barbara don't either. And what's interesting, it, it caused, a, it caused a, an, an alliance, not only of environmental groups which tend to be very liberal, but all the conservative business organizations, the chambers of commerce, uh, the hotel owners, the restaurant owners, they don't want it either because it destroyed their sole source of business, which is tourism. I mean, you're either an oil town or you're a tourist town. You can't be both. So given the downsides to the rigs' presence in the ocean, why is the alternative option of converting the rigs into reefs still on the table? This question brought me to Milton Love, a research biologist at UCSB. For 21 years now, he has been studying the role that offshore platforms play as a fish habitat. Uh, platforms are essentially very tall reefs that are made out of steel. And if you have uh, rockfishes that are drifting around in the plankton, very young rockfishes, uh, all they're looking for is something to settle out on, something hard. And they don't care if it's steel, they don't care if it's rock, they don't care if it's a sewer line. They just want to encounter something. Well, a, a platform is a, a big lot of something. I mean, it covers from the bottom to the surface. It can be like 1,200 feet of, of stuff. And if you're down, little rockfish, and you're down like 50 feet below the surface, and you're just looking for something, you are more likely to encounter a great big platform than a relatively small reef. And that's the reason you tend to find much higher numbers of these young rockfishes on platforms than on uh, most reefs. Fishermen were another stakeholder in this issue, although they were divided in regards to the rigs. So I headed to the Santa Barbara Harbor to get a better understanding of the division. I was curious what trade-offs the community of fishermen observed in regards to the decommissioning oil rigs. My name is Lyle Erickson. I'm a commercial fisherman out of Santa Barbara. I've fished crab, rockfish, lobster, and I've even fished spot prawns. And I've fished on the oil rigs and just below them. And that's where we caught the spot prawns. Fishing out here is, is, is you know, always been like a major livelihood for people. In the light of overfishing happening throughout the world, I think that anything that promotes an environment for fish to thrive in is great. 
Now I wanted to hear from oil companies themselves, so I reached out to the Chevron Corporation as they were one of the principal operators. But the company declined to comment directly. I was able to speak with Carl Spetzler, a decision analyst and consultant who has worked with energy companies extensively over the past four decades. Oil companies are made up of many people, many engineers, many geophysicists, geologists. People that have been drawn to those kinds of professions are usually very much in touch with the environment and want to uh, be as careful with sustaining our earth and our future as possible. And for them, finding solutions that are helpful to all parties, that reduce the conflict, is almost ideal. What was it that you were able to do to shift the dial and kind of help everyone come to a conclusion about this? Well, there were a few things, but I think the first crucial thing was the realization by the environmentalists that many of them were not aware of how rich an ecosystem had grown up on the, these platforms. We conduct two kinds of surveys around oil platforms. Uh, scuba surveys from the surface, about the surface, down to about 100 feet. And then uh, we use a, a little two-person submarine to go from 100 feet down to the bottom of the deepest platforms, which can be as much as 1,200 feet of water. So um, uh, attached to the uh, platform, you have all of these invertebrates. And uh, the first 100 feet or so is uh, basically mussels and all of the uh, organisms that are associated with mussels. So you get a lot of white anemones, you get green anemones, you have crabs walking around, you have nudibranchs, all kinds of stuff. You get below that, uh, you get a layer of what are called club anemones, which are these little bitty anemones, and we're talking hundreds of thousands, millions of them probably. A platform that's, let's say, 400 feet deep, that runs from the surface to 400 feet, you may have 50 or 60 or 70 different species of fish. So what else appealed to environmentalists? And also the realization that removing the platforms would itself cause a major environmental impact. Just being able to take the things out of the water was a huge issue. There, at the time, were, was no infrastructure for bringing them on into the port. Um, air quality, so the issues with diesel exhaust. So it's a very complicated process that removed these uh, platforms and it has significant consequences. So that shifted the viewpoint of many of the environmentalists that, hey, maybe leaving the bottom part in place might not be such a bad idea. But how did they synthesize all their data and so many perspectives to make a decision? It seems impossible. So typically what, what a policy analysis would do without a decision analysis would be to take each of those factors individually and say this is, you know, this is the impact or the results or consequences of the two decommissioning options on marine mammals. And so what that means is it would leave the decision makers with the job of trying to somehow integrate all of those pieces and say, so is option A better, worse than option B overall? This is where Max's decision-based model was put to use and turned these abstract concerns and values into clear mathematical facts. Here we see eight attributes that the stakeholders care about. Each one contains the results and methodology of a detailed study, with best to worst outcomes given the decision options. Then we have a control center. This generates adjustable swing weights. A swing weight reflects what a given individual cares about. This is a way for each stakeholder to place emphasis on a certain attribute. And the really nice thing about mathematical decision analysis is that it lets you turn all these different knobs and see the effect on the ultimate choice. And so we were able to say, so if costs changed by this much, or air emissions changed by that much, 
here's how it would affect the ultimate choice between options. Amazingly, they found that the only circumstance that favors complete removal is if you prioritize strict compliance with the original leases above all other attributes. This was a major insight because previously stakeholders thought that their relative opinions would impact the ultimate decision. In the end, what we discovered was that many but not all the attributes suggest the same conclusion, that is, converting to reefs. You would only favor complete removal if you believe that adhering to the original lease overrides everything else. They didn't need to agree on the attributes, on the importance of the attributes, to nevertheless come to agreement about what the best decision option was. So, although we still didn't support this law in 2010 because we just wanted the platforms removed. At least we felt that there was going to be a meaningful evaluation from a very scientific standpoint. And not just looking at the ecosystem from a fisheries perspective, but the pollution perspective as well, because leaving these platforms at sea does create long-term pollution risks. But wouldn't the rigs to reefs option save energy companies a whole lot of money? because they'd only remove the top 85 feet? According to our analysis, working with the oil rig engineers, removing these 27 rigs is going to cost well over a billion dollars if they remove them entirely. And if they go to the reefs option, where they just remove the top part of it, that could save perhaps half a billion dollars. Some of the environmental groups didn't feel so great about saving the oil companies half a billion dollars, so the option was suggested of splitting that savings between the operators of the platforms, the oil companies, and a new fund for ocean conservation. The model was that savings then should go into a state-operated fund on behalf of marine conservation issues and on behalf of a sustainable future for all of us. So while it did save industry some money, the massive contribution would be made that supported all of us who care about the ocean and the economies that rely on it. On September 30th, 2010, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger approved Assembly Bill number 2503, the California Artificial Reef Program. In this project, uh, I really am delighted with how the uh, very broad uh, range of participation was integrated and uh, they found a solution that was really productive for almost all of the parties involved. And it's a way to get to win-win-win and avoid losing a lot of the, the opportunity. If you consider how this would normally be done, it would be stuck in controversy and legal battles and uh, all kinds of people trying to slow it down just to, to be able to uh, have the losses or the, the cost of it be dis, uh, postponed to the future. So uh, the fact that uh, Max and his team and all the parties together could co collaborate and look for the best solution and then find a way of distributing the benefits of that solution in such a way that the environment and the various parties would win. Uh, I think that's tremendous. That's, that's the, the, the model we want for the future. We're in a little bit of a rarefied position here where independent, academic, robust science including agency science. We've got fabulous scientists within our agencies that are just very, very thoughtful stewards of our ocean resources. And um, to make certain that science is, is invited to that table is, it's a, it's a pretty sweet deal. And you know, now we're challenged with things like climate change and you know, um, 
population growth and we need to be very, very good at decisions going forward and I think this is a wonderful model that can be used on a lot, lot of different policy decisions. As someone who cares deeply about powering our world in a sustainable way, I am encouraged by how decision analysis was implemented in the Rigs to Reefs resolution. Perhaps decision science is something that can enable us to move past the political gridlock that seems so prevalent in our world today, because we don't have time to wait around. So going into this project, you know, it was not clear that, you know, any reasonable solution was going to come out of it that would satisfy, you know, more than one party. And uh, what was really amazing to us in this project was actually we did come up with a solution that satisfied almost everyone. And I can't say that always happens, but <laughs> that's what we seek for.